So Brian, if you'd like to come up. Uh, I have a few notes here. These are pretty good. Yeah, yeah. As you probably know by now, Brian's a uh, entrepreneur, a little bit on the younger side. Has, uh, to me anyways, maybe not to you. He has three, uh, three automobile businesses, automotive businesses, which is pretty cool. Um, and I know he's been attending KBA for a long time, and it says here for eight years, and uh, it's been helpful gaining insight. But I like uh, his third point, which is even better in that he's already retired. You won't know it by now, but he retired as a youth pastor. So, so that's pretty cool. And he still has a heart for the next generation. And so as we asked him for his insights, you know, this really resonated apparently with where his passion is and his calling is, is how do we work with the younger people and especially in revealing the kingdom to them. So I've gotten to know Brian over these years and, and he's a real inspiration to me. And so I, I'm really excited to hear your, your, your testimony and, and what you have to share. So let's welcome Brian. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. All right. Well, blessed to be here with you all. Have you adjusted to the chi time change yet? You all adjusted? See, uh, my pastor had a great idea. He said, why don't we just make the time change happen at 4 p.m. on Monday and call it happy hour? It'd be way more effective, right? Okay. Well, uh, can, I, can I pray real quickly before we start? Would you all pray with me? Father, it's uh, an honor to come before you to seek your counsel and your wisdom. Uh, many lives, many testimonies in this room. But I pray today that you would use that which you've put on my life and my heart to share a, a timely word about the next generations, how you're going to work, and how you will bless them. And Father, may the meditation of my heart be what comes out, Lord, and the Spirit working through me. Of course, we don't need to hear from another man. We need to hear from you. So God, have your blessings and favor upon us this morning, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, cool. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the millennial mission field. And I would pose the question, how many of you would say that you really kind of have a vague understanding or really don't know what millennial means or what, who the millennials are? Does anybody, I mean, you can be honest, do you kind of not know? Good, I honestly, a, a year ago, this was relatively new terminology to me as well. And so uh, let me ask you this question. How many of you have children or know somebody between the age of 15 and 34? Okay, well congratulations, you know a millennial, okay? Millennial is just another sort of fancy term for the Y generation or Generation Y. And these were generally born between the uh, range of 1980 to the early 2000s. So that's what we classify as a millennial, okay? It's just uh, semantics. Um, today we're gonna take a deep look into the, the minds of the millennials, okay? and. Here's some, this is kind of fun, here's some examples, this is not on the screen, we'll get to that in just a moment. But here's some examples of famous quotes that the millennial generation might rewrite, okay? First one is, and some of these may be familiar, some not, but the first one is, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. Kind of an old adage, right? Well, the millennials would rewrite that and say, life is what happens when you're looking at a smartphone, okay? That's how they would re rewrite that one. Here's a second one. A picture is worth a thousand words. You ever heard that one? Here's how a millennial would say that. An emoji is worth a thousand words. Do you know what an emoji is, by the way? Okay. Don't worry. Don't feel bad. An emoji is when you, when you text message or you're on Facebook and you put the little smiley faces and the little emotion cons or emoticons, that's, they call that a, an emoji. Congratulations. You're brilliant now. Um, the third one would be two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled. They might rewrite that to say, two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less tweeted about. Do you know what tweeting is? You use Twitter to tweet, okay? <laughs> all right, the fourth one would be, you are what you eat. We all know that one, right? A millennial would say, you are what you download. They're all about the computers. All right, lastly, uh, before we get started, does anyone have any questions? That's what you always hear, uh, you know, teachers would say that or so on and so forth. A millennial might say, before we get started, does anyone need to check their email? Okay, so the millennial generation is a very tech-savvy generation. You think about smartphones, iPads, emails, Twitter, Facebook. They are the generation that grew up knowing these technologies. They're very much integrated in their lives. In fact, if you watch somebody between the ages of 15 and 34, it's very hard for them to be in a room with other people like we are, sitting at a table, 
and not doing this. It's awkward. So to put the phone down, in fact, when we did youth ministry, which I did for eight years, and by the way, not to get too deep into terminology, but sometimes God will call you to an area of ministry or a, a place for a season. That was the last eight years for, for me, uh, was in youth ministry. And when we did, um, we hosted Bible studies at our house on Wednesday nights, and we fed the students, and we would make them put their cell phones on the table. And it was like, I mean, it was like crack. Them watching the, the, the phones buzz on this table, they were like, uh, you know, it was, and it was good to separate from them because they actually could eliminate the distraction and focus on God's word. So very tech-savvy generation. So as I mentioned, I did youth ministry for eight years, um, and late October was the culmination of that season. So now I've went into more of a, an adjunct pastoral care role at our church. Um, but in November, I got to go down to Brazil with a gentleman named Paul Cooney. Some of you may remember Paul from the Christian Business Alliance uh, conference. Um, he, uh, he's, a, he's a, I guess, well-renowned Kingdom Marketplace speaker. And we went down, and I shared to like a thousand young people a message on leadership. And I started to see God's kind of anointing, I, I guess, even after youth ministry as it pertains to my heart for young people. Um, and as Jim mentioned, I have three businesses now, and we steward over all three. They're God's businesses. I just happen to be operating them. Um, and ironically, 11 of our 13 staff members are millennials. And honestly, I didn't really know that stat till I was preparing, and I go, holy cow. 11 of the 13 staff members are under the age of 34 in our organization. So, a funny story, one of our, um, our shop foremen, I'm in automotive service and repair, and we have a rental car company, but our shop foreman, um, we were at a, an event, and we were talking about millennials. Well, all of a sudden, he enters the picture, and I said, Brian, his name's Brian. I said, Brian, you're a millennial. And he goes, no, I'm not. I said, well, you're 34, you're right on that millennial age break. And he said, no, I'm not. He's like, millennials is a mindset. He's like, my mind isn't the previous generation. And, and you know, depending on your upbringing, in myself included, I'm 34. In my upbringing, I have, my father was from a small farm town in Iowa, so it was very blue collar, right? It was very grounded. And so being on that cusp, sometimes it is a mentality. But, and, you're, and we'll get into that in a little more detail here shortly. Here's an interesting statistic. Uh, the number one reason millennials leave companies is they don't feel valued or respected. You know what, and I would say that's a good old-fashioned Oscar Mayer baloney because here's the reality. We all know this. If you operate businesses or if you have peers in business, you'll know that when somebody doesn't feel valued or respected, their eyes are going gonna to look the other way anyway. If somebody in your organization does not feel valued or respected, this is the most common, one of the top two or three reasons why people leave companies anyway. So that statistic is not just for millennials. That transcends um, all generations, I believe. So today we're going to look at some key truths about millennials, and then some applications for each of those truths. And I'm hoping that it'll be helpful for uh, everyone as we progress in the marketplace. And by the way, we're going to look at it from a marketplace facet and then also from a mission field facet. And I do not want to assume that they are mutually exclusive by any stretch. Marketplace and mission field are mutually inclusive. Okay, They ought to be combined and merged, and we ought to walk in our purpose um, whether we're focusing on saving hearts for Christ or growing our business for Christ. Amen? Okay. So, um, I think that this will hopefully help you gain a leg up in the marketplace, maybe understanding millennials, but also, and most importantly, against the enemy and social pressures to win hearts for millennial generations. Okay? So, here we go. We're going to start with a marketplace. Okay, this is a I believe this picture sort of embodies the millennial generation. If you looked into a, a lounge at a, a college, okay, or maybe a home group or a Bible study with youth, this is, this is what you would expect to see. You've got an, an iPad, uh, a computer, an iPod or a cell phone. Somebody has an earbud in listening to music. That's called an earbud, by the way, that, as a terminology for that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she's got headset, headphones on, and she's kind of zoned out. So this is very common depiction of what the millennial generation looks like. So, um, and I don't have notes printed for you. By the way, if, if you want the, the outline for this or the, pres or the uh, PowerPoint, I'm glad to submit that to Jim and Mike and we can get that onto you, okay? So here's the first truth. Millennials are not all the same, okay? 
as you start to hear more and more, you're going to hear the media, you're going to hear studies all say that the millennial generation this, the millennial generation that, and there are stereotypes that exist just like every other generation. So that's the first truth, okay? Um, millennials can possess all of the same attributes of every other staff member. For instance, some staff members are hardworking, some are lazy, some are motivated, some are entitled, some are enthusiastic, some are flat. Would you agree with that? That's any business, anywhere in the marketplace, you're going to find that. Here's an application to this truth. I would encourage you to refine your hiring process to make sure that you're picking the right attributes to begin with. Okay, refine your hiring process so that you're looking for the same qualities, whether they're 60 years old or 20 years old. You're looking for some of the same qualities and attributes, but don't see them as all the same because they're not. Just like, I mean, we could all converse in the same room and I have unique personality characteristics, so does Jim, so does Eric, so does Larry, so does Mike, um, and we're all gonna be a little unique, but you can still hire the qualities you wanna hire. And then practice different ways to motivate them, okay? So, uh, for instance, I have an example here. One example might be for motivation. With a millennial generation, consider using videos or other media to, pay, to portray stories. Millennials like to hear stories because they can relate and they like to be motivated. So if, for instance, what we've done in, in some of our staff meetings, our monthly staff meetings, is we'll take a company like, um, who did we feature one time? Um, Nautique Boats. Okay, Ski Nautic, it's a high-end boat manufacturer. They have kingdom missions that they execute within their business very practically, but we'll focus on key aspects of customer service and we'll share a video about that, that business so they can see it and feel it and sort of strike a chord with them to help encourage them to implement some of these things you're thinking about. So think about stories or media applications, videos, as ways to motivate the millennial generation. Here's a second truth. Millennials want to be trained, okay? They want to be trained. This is a terminology that I've used, and, and I'm sort of guilty, because I don't want to be um, disrespectful or condescending, but when you, you hear people say, teach old dogs new tricks, right? You've heard that sort of terminology. So figuratively speaking, old dogs are reluctant to learn new tricks. You, okay, that's not always the case, but it can be. Uh, millennials are all about learning new tricks because it helps them gain relevance and significance. They're really yearning for that, okay? Because when the media paints this picture of millennials, they wanna have relevance, they wanna be relevant to older generations, and they wanna have significance, okay? They wanna understand the reason, the process, the purpose, and the value in what they're doing. And it's our obligation to make sure that we're helping them achieve those. They like results and they want to know that they're making an impact. They are very results oriented. They want to see the fruits of what they're doing, whether it's on a very small level, a micro level, or a large scale level, or macro level, okay? And most millennials uh, want feedback at least monthly. That's a key point, I really want you to get that. Most millennials want feedback at least monthly, okay? Older generations, um, you can paint your own picture but you hire somebody and you say, you basically expect that person to work hard when you hire them, right? Here's your job outline, here's your description, go, okay? It's not gonna be the case with millennials. Why is that? Well, here's a play on words. Why is the why? Here's what I mean by that. The why is they want training. They want to know why they're doing something, okay? So why do they wanna be trained? Because they wanna know why they're doing it. So we have to be diligent in outlining the why for them, okay? Here's an application. Expecting them just to work hard right out of the box and learn uh, along the way will likely lead to disappointment. Just gonna forewarn you. If you just expect them to plug into a job description and say, go get them, you're gonna be set up for disappointment and so are they. Frequently schedule evaluation sessions at least once a month. You ought to be able to come into your office or, or keep them in close quarter and give them feedback. And by the way, folks, um, saying good job or you need to do better, that's not really gonna get it done either. You need to be constructive, you need to be critical in a positive way if you so wish, but you need to give details and fine print as to how they can progress, okay? Here's another uh, application. Give more frequent promotions 
with fewer increases. For instance, a millennial might feel blessed by a 50 cent raise or a quarter raise. It lets them know that there's reward, that they're making a difference in their own lives and they want to progress, okay? Entrepreneur Magazine wrote this quote, motivate them and make their work more meaningful and challenging than boomers made it for you. Who, when I say boomers, who am I talking about? Who are they talking about? The baby boomer generation, right? They say, motivate the millennials and make their work more meaningful than the boomers made it for you. And this is talking about, if you're a baby boomer generation, that's awesome. You guys have been awesome for transforming this nation post-war era. But if you're not a, if you're not a baby boomer, um, this applies to you. Reading this kind of shocked me because I realized we used to have staff meetings and I would do all these creative and innovative things to, to create motivation for our staff members. And some of our technicians were in their mid 40s and I would look over and they would be glazed in the eyes and long in the face. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And I'd look over here and I'd see these young millennials, they'd be on the edge of their seat leaning forward, like show me more. And it, was, it really was true. I, we have to really, for that generation, we really need to motivate and encourage them and find ways to creatively inspire them. Forbes recently published an article that said, the secret to managing millennials could be, coached, uh, could be summed up in one word, coaching. Forbes said they can be summed up in one word, coaching. Study shows that millennials, I'm gonna read this verbatim real quickly. The study shows that millennials want and do well with feedback and comparatively speaking, lots of it. They crave and respond to a good positive coach who can make all the difference in their success. Millennials told us they want more feedback from their managers. Most millennials want feedback at least monthly, whereas non-millennials are comfortable with feedback less often. Overall, millennials want feedback 50% more than any other employee. Interesting, okay? Moving on here. Truth number three, millennials want growth. They want growth. It's ingrained in who they are. Maybe you've heard the hype about millennials working 20 different jobs. Before I knew what a millennial was, all I heard people was saying was how millennials are gonna work at least 20 jobs on average during their career. Can you imagine that? Has anybody in here worked one job for the most of their post-collegiate career? Okay, but maybe two or three or five or something like that, but 20? That's astounding. They say that the millennials will work 20 different jobs in their career. Many of them, here's the reality, many of them will work a vast number of jobs during their career, but that's mostly for owners or managers who are not willing to accept change, okay? If you're not willing to accept change, odds are you're gonna lose them. Here's an application for you. Create models or ladders so that they can see a path to success. Some of the old, like, ladders, you know, what, uh, climb the ladder, corporate ladders and things got squashed and flattened during the sort of the, the 90s era. But I think bringing some of those back and let them see a pathway to success. Because folks, if you don't create that path, they're going to seek it elsewhere. If you don't give them room for growth and let them see where that growth is going to be manifested, there's a high likelihood you'll lose them. All right, truth number four, millennials want flexibility. This is a key one because I think this might be the hardest area for us to change as business owners. Older generations, this is a key one. So I hope you'll uh, take, take this to heart. So you might ask yourself, how in the world can I be more flexible than I already am? I mean, I'm already giving you a, a retirement plan. I'm already giving you two way, a weeks paid vacation. I'm, I'm already giving you money through Friday hours. Well, baby boomers, and by the way, this isn't articulated by my thoughts and notions. This is a uh, aggregate accumulation, okay, of what I studied and read. Baby boomers were a privileged, grossly optimistic generation who was wealthier, active, and more physically fit than the World War era generations. If you're a boomer and you can look back a little bit, that should be generally true. Generation X, you're next. They were hippies, materialistic outcasts, and disenfranchised proponents of change. Again, paraphrasing. Generation Y, or millennials, are no different in that they need earlier generations to meet their needs as well. Okay? Here's the application. Find unique ways to motivate them. Find unique ways to achieve continuity between work and life. And by the way, guys, work-life balance, we heard this terminology, work-life balance, it's non-existent for millennials because they're intertwined for them. Their same 
application, their mindsets, their philosophies, they, they intertwine between work and life. There's none of this, I'm going to go 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, so that I can go home and be with my wife, and then on Saturdays I'll work on the yard, and Sundays I'll have a Sabbath and I'll go to church. It's all intertwined for the millennial generation. And we need to find unique ways to involve them. Here's a suggestion. You can write this down if you want. And this is not on the slide. For continuity between work and life for millennials, two ideas. One, consider plans where they might be able to work from home. I know, it's pretty radical for a lot of us. Consider ways that they might be able to work from home. Second thing would be give them more time to do the things they enjoy outside of work. I can tell you we have, a, uh, the guys under 30 in our organization, they love snowboarding and they love dirt biking. It's cool, get outside, be active, don't play video games all day, right? If you let, for instance, say, okay guys, I want you, or so-and-so, I want you to take a Wednesday off, and I want you to go up snowboarding. They love that because everybody's up on Saturday snowboarding and it takes forever to get there and forever to get back, but they go on a Wednesday, maybe they can tell one of their buddies, hey, take a Wednesday off, let's go up. And they get to brag about that. And as soon as you get them bragging to their friends about what they can have in your business, it's a win, okay? All right. Truth number five. Millennials want to make an impact. Okay, they want to make an impact. Millennials embrace social responsibility, okay, as one of their core values. And they also want to be more involved in decision making. This is, shouldn't be news to any of us, but don't you agree we should be doing good works in our community anyway because it's biblical and part of our kingdom-minded stewardship? Would you agree with that? There's a noble obligation to fulfill community works anyways, just as a Christ follower in business. So this shouldn't be anything new to any of us, but I'll tell you what, millennials, they really take this seriously. Social responsibility for a millennial generation is huge. It is, it's a major deal for them. Here's the application. Involve them in charitable giving or ask them how you can help give to a cause of their choice. One of my mentors, uh, Wes Gardner, they have what they call uh, uh, prime days. They actually, like one day a month, their staff, they literally make them take a day off and they go serve in the community, whether it's repairing somebody's roof, uh, serving a widow, uh, feeding at a homeless shelter, or whatever. It doesn't have to always be a charity or a mission, uh, excuse me, yeah, uh, a charity organization. But they make them go out and serve. Something else you can do is, this is a small thing that's very practical. Pick small and trivial yet important decisions to get their ideas on it in your business. Even if it's a, like a second month hire, Ask them a question, get their feedback, and then do what they said. You know, so pick something small that's not going to make or break you if, if they decide something radical. But do it because it makes them feel like they're making an impact in your business. And then you get buy-in, right? It's called buy-in from the employee, which is very valuable. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay. Now I want to focus specifically on the mission field. All right, now we're talking about winning hearts for Christ in the millennial generation. Sounds pretty daunting, right? Because a lot of us, and I'm included, we think, how am I going to be relevant to the youth of today? Right? I'm old-fashioned, or I don't have a, an iPad, or, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm, I'm stereotyping. But I want to focus on the, the mission field here for just a few moments. Okay? Here's a truth. Biblical truth transcends generations. How do we know that? Well, look at Psalm 105. It says, For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It doesn't say through my generation or the baby boomer or the World War era. It says all generations. We're talking about from, like, Moses to future Moses. Tribulation, right? Revelations. It transcends all generations. The keys to be effective in saving millennial souls, generally speaking, are full, fourfold. Be inspiring, be truthful, be loving, and be transparent. By the way, I would venture to say if you apply these principles to sharing the gospel with anybody, you might have a reasonable level of success. Be inspiring, be truthful, be loving, 
and be transparent. Here's the application. Understand what society is teaching as acceptable and lovingly offer the counterpart. Help them reach their purpose, a God-driven purpose. I'll tell you a story. For years doing youth ministry, I thought it looked like, okay, kids, sit down, or on Sunday mornings, all right, everybody get in your seats. Now, today we're going to talk about purity, okay? And this, this, do as I say, I have this conviction, and it's sort of a, I'm imparting me onto them. Now, they want relationships. They want role models. But here's what we learned. About two and a half years ago, we changed the model with which we taught. And what we did was we tried to make Scripture as black and white as possible and let them make the decision on what it says. So, for instance, instead of saying Psalm 100, instead of me saying, okay, guys, um, how can I apply this? The Lord is good and his love endures forever. It always is going to endure. I mean, and I'm, um, I'm really making it about me and about trying to make it um, subjective, make it objective. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. So, for instance, we, we talked about homosexuality, right? We talked about this topic, and here's why. is because many of us in, in, the, in the kingdom, sort of as Christians, we're afraid to approach it. And the, the longer and longer time goes on, we get a little bit more trepidatious about approaching that subject. Why? Because anti-cultural is being cultural now. It's becoming cultural. So the things that, like being anti-cultural, being against culture, is now becoming cultural. If you can stand on stage at the Grammys in front of 15 million people and say something radical and you're a pop star, the odds of that sticking in the media and the, mark, and the uh, society are very high. So we would start teaching them, say, let's just read through some scriptures. And we, you, know, you, you point them and you say, is this black and white or is this gray? We don't want it to be gray. We want it to be black and white. And we want them to pose their own decisions based on clearly what God's word says. So we, we used to understand what society is teaching. We would love or lovingly offer the counterpart. Because, by the way, if you just beat them over the head with a Bible, and this is probably for everybody, it's not going to work. They need to understand God's word, but they also need to understand in a loving way why what culture says is right isn't always right. That's, it's an everyday thing for them. They're being told that, Wearing skimpy clothing and, you know, selling your, your appearance is all that matters. Well, it's not, and we all know that here. Millennials, excuse me, need mentors. They really do. And you know who the mentors should be? Everybody in here. Interesting stat here. Seven out of ten who leave the church after high school say they didn't have close friendships in church, and nine out of 10 who left said they didn't have a mentor. This is, this is like a Barna group stat. That's crazy to me. Think about it. If this is reality, maybe it's just coincidence that seven out of 10 who left the church after high school said they didn't have a close friendship, but how would those stats change if they did have a close friendship? Think about that. Nine out of 10 who left said they didn't have a mentor. So if, and I'm going to be uh, presumptuous here, if mentoring a millennial meant that 9 out of 10 more would stay in the church after high school, wouldn't that be a good investment? I mean, think about that. Just, just mentoring. I, I don't know what that means. You have to ask the Lord what that means to you. But if it just means going up to a millennial every day in church, just finding one and just introducing yourself and asking if you can pray for them or ask them what's going on in their life or what school they go to, starts there. Just like sharing the gospel. you got to start somewhere, right? What do you know about God? Have you ever been to church? Have you ever heard this name Jesus? Or, you know, when somebody says they're spiritual, what do you think that means? I and mean, there's all these leading questions. Okay? Um, and here's the, uh, sorry, let me get, get to the, here you go. Here's the application. 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. It's pretty clear, right? Paul was writing to Timothy, his sort of millennial mentee, and he's saying, keep teaching, keep preaching, keep, keep pouring into this church. And he's talking to a, so to speak, millennial of his, of his time. Teach them scripture. Share stories about what God's doing in your business and how you got there. Teach them stewardship principles that are biblical and can translate practically. Teach them to share their faith with others. Here's a killer statistic for you. How about this one? A good friend of mine 
is uh, Greg Steer, founder of Dare to Share. Are you all familiar uh, with Greg or Dare to Share ministry? Okay. Dare to Share is a ministry that devotes their sole focus to teen evangelism. Okay? That's all Greg Steer does all day long. And he is a very high-energy, passionate man. He said that they have learned that if you can get a, uh, a youth sharing their faith with others, that sort of goes hand-in-hand hand with having a mentor. They're, the odds go up by like 80% that they'll remain in their faith. If you can teach them to share their faith with others, they will stay in their walk with Christ. So we need to make sure that we're um, helping them do that, okay? Here's the final truth. Millennials can sense fakeness and forged concern. We learned this early on in, in youth ministry. You better be real, right? And if, if you're just, uh, I want to say this lovingly, you got to be able to connect. You got to genuinely care when you talk to them. Because if they just feel like this is just some older guy trying to be a hero, you know, they can sense that. And when you try to teach them biblical truth, I read a stat, this is kind of uh, aggravating to me, but it also said that if you read your scriptures in, in front of them, they're not going to want that. They're not going to want to read the Bible if they just see you in public reading it. And I'm like, that's really troubling to me. I don't know where this, I mean, I also think it was a Barna stat, but it doesn't matter. What they want to see is they want to see that you connect with them. They want to see that you genuinely care about them because otherwise there's going to be no practical, um, there's going to be no genuinity. Is that the word I'm looking for? No genuineness. And they'll turn and go the other way. Because think about it, on social media, Facebook, how many of you have a Facebook account? Okay. On Facebook, they're, they're seeing videos after videos after videos, and it's kind of like if you're going to become an anchor person, you study and you watch anchor person videos of the greats. And this probably can apply to anything, sports. I played sports professionally for five years. I used to watch film of the greatest football players over and over and over again, and I see what, what it looks like. So once they have a picture of what being genuine looks like or being relatable looks like, they can see it from a mile away if it's not that because they're, they're exposed to so much uh, in terms of video and stories and so on. So here we go. Being upfront and honest as well as loving will cultivate the best relationships. That's kind of 101, but let's just be reminded of that. So here's the application. Walk the walk. We all should be doing that anyway, right? Billy Graham said, always share the gospel when necessary, use words. Okay, so walk the walk. Make Jesus relevant and integrated within all areas of life. Keep them entrenched in missions. Matthew 28, 19 says, we, we all should know this, go and make disciples of all nations. And then tie your good works to the Bible. If, if you're serving and you're doing something to bless somebody, tell a millennial why you're doing that. You know, let them relate that in their mind and let them see that it's genuine in your reason for doing this. And lastly, I would, um, I would encourage you with this. Don't give up and never stop praying. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. God's will for us is that we would never stop praying. And when you feel like you're trying, and whether it's in your business or in your church or, or maybe you're a missionary, when you don't think you're getting through, don't stop praying, right? And mentor told me years ago is like when you feel that kind of ugliness from somebody you feel like they don't like you or whatever it is we all have challenges in the marketplace we feel like a peer just doesn't see eye to eye with us pray for them and immediately you start to feel that burden lifted but don't stop praying you know i uh, i'll share a story quickly don delos who's here for marketplace chaplains works with our organization and yesterday i overheard with our youngest member who's 21 his name's dustin and um Don gets to talk to Dustin about his family, about his work life, and so on and so forth. Well, Dustin has ongoing concerns with his mother. And I got to witness Don kind of employing this yesterday, a lot of the things we're teaching here. And on the way out, Don says, oh, by the way, Dustin, how's your mother? And Dustin says, well, she's still struggling. She's got, I think, MS or something like that. She's got a debilitating disease. And uh, Don says, well, I have good news. And he said, what's that? He said, God loves you. And he loves your mom as well. And he said, do you know what a relationship with God looks like? And Dustin said, yeah. And he said, well, what does it look like? He said, well, you just ask him to be your savior. And Dustin knew this. He goes to church every so often. 
But it was just cool for me. Don, I don't know how old you are, but you're not 35, right? I'm guessing. And so, and so he, he's an older generation relating. And it, it just, it really, as long as it comes from the heart and you really, you genuinely care about them, uh, we should be able to really bless this next generation. And if you look at scriptures, God's going to raise up leaders in every generation, uh, just like he did, um, you know, Joshua, just like he did Timothy, and all through the Bible. So um, if you'll pray with me, we'll, we'll kind of close this, and uh, we'll ask God to continue to work. Father, there's a lot of statistics. There are things that we don't really understand. And while some might say the proof is in the pudding, Lord, when we see a heart changed for Jesus, when we see lives transformed, when we see an 18-year-old keep their faith through college and, and enter into adulthood as a Christ follower, that's a manifestation of your power and your will. So we abide by your word. We thank you for your scriptures, which are true from the beginning of time to the end of time. We thank you for an opportunity to seize relationships with the millennial generation and those that have come before and will come after. God, inspire us to be genuine. Inspire us to be flexible. Inspire us to see in, in those cracks, those little crevices within our business and also within the mission field that will allow us to, to make an impact for Christ and for the kingdom. God, Matthew 6, is on our hearts here at KBA, and we, we pray today that as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord, you will meet our needs, but we also believe that would fall over into, um, into changing the hearts of millennials and to teaching them great stewardship principles and practices. So God, fill our hearts with energy, God, let us not believe that we are so different that we cannot relate to people of other genders, ages, and even religions. So, Father, you are superior, you're sovereign. We love you. We thank you for your chance to learn and grow under your hand and your covering. And pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you. Go. <laughs> the millennials. <laughs> wow, not only was that a great talk, but you nailed the time. <laughs> it's 7.59. Or, yeah, 7.59. So we have a few minutes for questions. And I thought, you know, that was so uh, meaningful and uh, has a lot of meat to it. And for sure, we want to get those uh, slides. I want to get the slides for my business. And, uh, and we'll send them out, right? Yeah, we had a millennial. He wants back in, but uh, great, a, a great young man, just an incredible young man. Uh, great uh, personality, great attitude, incredibly smart. Uh, was accepted to Colorado School of Mines, and we put him to work. And uh, he just had difficulty uh, showing up to work. <laughs> and then, then one day, he didn't show up to work at all. You know, and he came back like a couple weeks later, and he says, I'm back. I'm like, <laughs> I'm still dealing with that, but so I got to, I, I mean, I need training. Not to mention that I have five children who are in that category. <laughs> so not only from a work standpoint, from a relational standpoint with my older children, I'm looking forward to putting some of this to practice. But anyways, there's a, I'd like to open up for some questions. Well, I have four millennial children, and what you said is very, is pretty, I'm amazed how accurate. I mean, just talking about the interest in social, um, uh, not maybe justice or, yeah, possibilities. Um, also, as a missionary kid, and I grew up in three different countries, U.S., Brazil, Portugal, um, and it's increasing global society. Um, just my question is, does millennial apply to pretty much all countries? Would you, would you be able to say... Or is it mostly those who have um, more uh, in tune with like social media, um, all the internet kind of stuff? Well, that's a really good question. So to reiterate that, does, does the millennial generation go outside of the boundaries of America, say? The answer is yes. And although there are cultural differences in different countries around the world, surely, and I'm not an expert on that, but I can tell you if you go to Russia, or Africa or China, 
you will see that um, there are cultural differences in maybe some of the up upbringings, okay? They don't necessarily have the post-World War generation, the baby boomer generation, and so on and so forth. But here's what they do, here's what's con contiguous and congruent, is, is that internet, social media is the same. You can log on to your Facebook account in Brazil, and you can see the exact same things you can see here. So information and the, their ability to plug into the internet, that is consistent. And so you will see a lot of similarities. Now, whether or not they have trouble getting to work on time, and by the way, we do experience that. We try to come up with some creative ways to, you know, to, to, to combat that. But yes, I, I do believe that it's, some similarities are equal amongst all generations. And I think generally you'll see that a lot of the social responsibility aspects of millennials will apply in other countries. Because they're seeing, like, think about the, uh, the ice, ice bucket challenge. Do you remember this? You know, you pour a bucket of ice or water over your head to raise money for, forgive me, what is it? ALS, yeah, Lou Gehrig's. I mean, everybody in the world is seeing those videos, right? So they see that they're doing something fun and creative to raise money for a good cause. Well, I, I, you know, it, it's gonna leak over into other countries, I, I believe. I'm glad to share a couple of other questions if you want. Um, my question would be this. I've heard it said that the Gen X and Boomer generations live to work, right? Workaholics and live to work, whereas Gen Y works to live. So that comes that mentality of I'm working just enough to be able to go up and ski for the whole winter. Um, well, you also said in the presentation that they don't have a work-life balance, meaning everything is just kind of, I just go fly by the seat of my pants. So that made me think of the talk we heard down at the CCBA, the integrated life, you know, Ken Allred's book. So we as kingdom business people and business owners should have that integrated life of, uh, we don't have church one week and, and business during the week and then church and then business. It should be all integrated. So reaching the Gen Y generation and teaching them kingdom approaches should be they should get that very easily because of the way they think. Now they just have to make one little easy tweak. Do you see that in your eight years working with youth to where maybe if someone got, you know, maybe they got turned on to, you know, really turn it on spiritually, it became something where they just integrated it into their life because they don't really have a on and an off switch. That's a really good point. And I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't, um, I didn't improperly articulate that point. Uh, most of us, we, we work really hard, and when we're at work, we're sold out for work, right? We'll get our, ourselves caught up working a, however long of a day, and then we have to turn that switch off. What, what Mike's saying, and to reiterate that point, is, is that they don't really have to worry about that on an off switch. For instance, not being on time, when, you're, when you go to work and you're worried about being there and you're trying to get there early, you're flipping that work switch, right? You're going, I gotta get to work on time. Because they don't really have to worry about the fluctuation between the two, it's like they'll be at work and they'll be thinking about snowboarding or motocross or getting home to check their social media, I don't know, whatever it is. So the, the creative ways to sort of combat that, um, let me think, by the way, we're, we're going through a process now of interviewing our millennial staff and, ask, and asking them literally, what matters most to you right now? Um, a couple of, one have said, I want to get out of debt, ironically, one have said that I want to buy a house and there is sort of a material application. Um, but I think that you just, you know, you'll find ways to figure out if something matters to them, again, if they want to work from home, that's, that's what their friends are doing, then you might have to be flexible and you might have to say, what battles can I choose to fight here and which ones can I not? Being on time in our organization is a mandatory thing. You have to be on time, by the way, five minutes early. So we, you know, we teach them how to do that. Say, so by the way, if you do this, then X. You can have Wednesday off. If, you, if you're on time every day for a month, maybe you get that Wednesday off to go snowboarding. I mean, you know, a risk reward thing. So hopefully I've kind of addressed that, Mike, but you had a great point. You're exactly right. It's, it, it is all meshed together for them. So if you can teach them to share the gospel in the same mindset, that ought to translate to wherever they go. They should be programmed to hopefully share the gospel. And I think we have seen some of that. And it's always tough. By the way, one of my greatest burdens in youth ministry was what happens when they graduate and how do we keep them locked into Jesus in college, it's really, really tough. Is there, are there any other questions? I don't know if we have time for one more. Okay. It seems to me like that we're always talking about these things when we're well into the genera generation X. 
uh, Generation Z is coming up sometime, and how can you see signs coming to where that you can start preparing how to deal with those? It's, it's uh, kind of hard because we're talking about 14 and under. Some of us, I'm, by the way, my wife and I are expecting our first baby next week, so I'm going to be giving, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to be, we're going to be having a child that's going to be fit right into the middle of that Gen Z uh, generation. But I think the only thing we can really do right now, because, I mean, only how much is a 13-year-old developed? How many signs can we see with a 13-year-old or under? But here's what you can know is look ahead, just like in business, be visionary. Think about all they're going to know now is social media, is internet, is electronics, right? All they're going to know is that insert the blank, uh, society thinks that insert the blank is okay, as opposed to what God's word says. That's all they're going to know because it's already started and now they're being born into it. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if I can answer that question exactly, but I think if you look ahead and you find out what are you seeing on a daily basis, what are you hearing, what's, what's a common characteristic in the marketplace, they're going to only know that from the day they're born and then things are gonna evolve from there. So take a look at the snapshot in time right now and sample it. Write down as many things as you can identify about what's going on right now, that's all they're gonna know. So I think it's to be determined on that. I wish I could share something more about that. 